Good morning. My name is Nancy Oakley. I'm the Director of Education and Events here at Citrus Valley Association of Realtors. Welcome to our session today called the Probate Process A to Z. Our instructor is Paul Horn. He's an attorney, CPA, and instructor with CAR. And um, thank you so much, Paul, for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Paul Horn, who is our instructor today, CPA, attorney. Did I forget anything, Paul? Well, the CPA, it stands for Chinese Party Animal, CPA, yes. just, just to be clear. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. I'm going to turn it over to you. The class is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, let's, let's start. So good morning, everybody. Um, so probate is what I do. I, 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 uh, I process probate. I'm an attorney. I'm a probate attorney. I happen to be a car instructor as well. You know, your California Association of Realtors. I have a certified course with car. So let's start. Okay, let's let's start. So this class, I think, is free for you, right? Type in a chat box. Is there a cost for this class, guys? Any question or comment? Just type in a chat box for me. Um, no, this class is free for our. Yeah, members. great. Yeah, you know, uh, thank you for Citrus Valley for for providing this two hour free education. You know, what I wanted to say is that it's free, but this two hour is, it's not really free. Your time is very expensive. So for those of you on this call, please take advantage of it, right? Ask me a question, you know, don't be shy. If you can just learn one thing, right? It's worth your two hours. So your time is not free, okay? Learn, learn something today. All right. so. Um, if you have any question, like I said, just type it in the chat box, something that you want me to cover, something that you always had a question in your mind that you want me to, to, to cover, type in a chat box and I will answer your question. Okay. All right. So let's start. So this is a probate class. Okay. The essence of probate is this. Someone died, they own a house. Someone died, they own a house. Let me ask you a question. As you're selling someone's house, you're selling someone's house, you're listing someone's house, who signs your escrow paperwork, guys? Type in the chat box, man. Who, who signs your paperwork? Who signs escrow paperwork? The seller. Yeah, the seller, the owner. Thank you, guys. The seller, the owner. But in this case, the seller, the owner is dead, right? They're in heaven. So, so, so which elevator, escalator will go to heaven to get the seller to sign off? That, that's it. That's the essence of this class. Your, the owner, right, normally signs escrow paperwork, listing agreement. This class is about your seller is in heaven, right? So obviously, of course, you know, there's no escrow in heaven yet. There's no iCloud escrow yet, right? So who steps into the deceased homeowner shoe to sign your listing agreement and escrow paperwork, right? That is the essence of this class. At the end of this two hour, you have to understand how to answer that question. Your client comes to you and says, my mom passed away, my dad passed away. Hey, Ronald Edison. Hey, Lulu Martin. Hey, Helen. Hey, Rich. You know, uh, Charles Lacey. Sell this house for me. What, what would you do, right? What would you do? Okay. The son or daughter says, hey, my mom died. My dad died. Sell this house for me. What would you do? That's it. That is the essence of this class. You have to answer that question, okay? You have to know the answer to that question. If you cannot answer that question when the class is over, you suck, I suck, right? Because we didn't do our job. We didn't learn together, okay? Iris Lamb says, pull the grandee. Iris, I, Iris Lamb says, enough talk, let's get into it. Okay, great. Iris Lamb, you are right. When the son or daughter comes and says, hey, my mom passed away, my dad passed away, the first thing you do, you're gonna pull the grandee. 
because you want to confirm, you want to confirm that, yeah, mom owns this house. Yeah, dad owns this house, right? So you want to confirm who is the owner. When you pull the grand deed, when you pull the grand deed, when you pull the grand deed, the owner is going to be situated in two categories. Okay. When you pull the grand deed, there's only two ways it can go as far as who owns the house. It's either going to be in the trust or not in the trust. Okay. It's that simple, guy. When someone dies, you just pull the grand deed. And how do you pull the grand deed, right? You, you know, talk to your title rep, right? The title rep's gonna give you the grand deed. When you get the grand deed, it's very simple, gang. It's either gonna be it's in a trust or it's not in a trust. That's it. When it's not in a trust, when it's not in a trust, then that's when a probate is needed. Okay. Okay. It's that simple. It's either in a trust, not in a trust. Okay. So so let's take the easy well yeah let's 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 take the easy one first if it's in a trust if it's in a trust if it's in a trust who has the power to sign your listing agreement guys so mom died you pull the grand deed the house is in a trust who who has the power to sign your listing agreement so Liz, Liz Beth, or Liz Beth, Elizabeth, Lacey, you're right. The successor trustee, the successor trustee has the power to sign your grandee. Okay, so the successor trustee, okay? All right, so, so, so let's 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 take this one step at a time, okay? Someone pass away, you pull the grand deed, the house is in a trust. The successor trustee is going to sign the listing agreement with you. So the next question I want to ask you is, how how will you know, guy, who is the successor trustee? How how will you know who is the successor trustee? So the, if the house is in a trust, the successor trustee does it. Yeah, so so Gar Clark, thank you. Yeah, it's it's in a trust, right? So my point is you're gonna have to get a copy of the trust. Get a copy of the trust. And 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 where will you get a copy of the trust from, guys? Where will you find a copy of the trust? Where will you find a copy of the trust? So the house is in the mom died, the house is in a trust, the successor trustee. It's gonna go ahead and sign this agreement. So you need to read the trust to see who is the successor trustee. So let's take the easy one for it. Uh, Garth Clark says, hey, um, yeah, you can call up the lawyer, right? You, so, this, so you can either call the lawyer or the family would have it, right? So let's do the lawyer first. We call the lawyer. This lawyer is dead. God damn it, this lawyer is good for nothing. He, when he did our trust, he didn't tell us he's gonna die. He's dead. This lawyer is dead. Can you believe the nerve of this lawyer? He's dead. All right, so he's, he, he's gone. So if you depend on your lawyer to keep a copy of your trust, right? You may be in a surprise because lawyer died too. You know, surprise, surprise, right? Okay. So don't depend on the lawyer. So a good lawyer will always give you a digital copy like this, guys. Will always give you a digital copy of what's in the trust so that you can email it to your children so that if they lose this original binder. Hey, 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 uh, uh, guys, do you think people lose a binder like this? Have you ever lost anything before in, in your life? Probably not, right? You never lose anything, right? Exactly, every time, right? People lose stuff. So if you lose this binder, please make sure you have a copy of it, okay? And normally, like I said, make sure from the inception of the creation of your trust, there's a copy. That's right, Rich, a PDF copy, all right? A PDF copy like this. All right, so, so, so let's just go down that path for a second. You pull the grandee, 
the house is in a trust. You pull the grand deed, the house is in a trust. You cannot find the trust. The lawyer is dead. The son, the daughter says, we can't find the trust. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? The damn lawyer, <gasps> Luz Campo says, the record office, the county recorder. <gasps> Luz says, what are you talking about, Paul Horn? Go to the county recorder. How many, how many of you right now have a trust? Just, just, just type in the chat box. Um, all right, so um, this, all right, so there's only two of you, Luz Campos and um, Lisa Baker. Lisa Baker, you have a trust. Lisa Baker, you have a trust. Veronica, you have a trust. Do you remember, Veronica? Do you remember, Lisa, of recording your trust with the county recorder? Lisa Baker, do you remember ever doing that, recording your trust at the county recorder, the whole entire trust? No, no, right? You never record your trust with the county recorder. The answer is no. So the, so the county recorder will not, N-O, will not have a copy of your trust. They're not gonna have it because that trust is a private document, right? Right? The trust is a private document that says when I die, who gets what? It's private, it's between I and my family, right? So if the lawyer is dead, he or she is dead, there's no copy, and the, fam the family don't have a copy of the trust, the county recorder don't have it, what are we going to do? The son or daughter wants to sell this house. The successor trustee needs to sign your listing agreement. We cannot find a copy of the trust to tell us who is the successor trustee. Now, what do we do? Cannot... <gasps> cannot find a trust. So um, some of you are saying go to court. Oh man, but but mom has had a trust to avoid court, to avoid court. Why, why do we have to do this? Rana Beatty, you're absolutely correct. Iris Lamb, you're right. It, Lamb, you're right. It has to go to probate. If you lose a copy of your trust, too bad so sad welcome to court welcome to the probate court because because the tr the the trust tells you who is in charge the successor trustee right the trust tells you who gets the house absence a copy of the trust too bad so sad welcome to probate it's just as if you never had a copy of um the trust okay okay all right okay so guys the long story is keep a copy of your trust, okay? Keep a copy of your trust, it's very important. So Luz Campos says the tax collector might have a copy. I would not bet on that Luz, okay? As you can see Luz Campos, if you took a survey of people who have a trust, and you ask them, Luz Campos, did you send a copy of the trust to the, to the, uh, to the tax collector? What would they say, Luz Campos, right? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so, 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 so make sure you have a copy, okay? All right, so, all right, let's, um, so that's easy, right? The house is in the trust, get a copy of this binder, Find out the successor trustee, sign your listing agreement, style the house, no probate. So a dead homeowner, the house is in the trust, great, no problem, great. Okay, all right. Okay. How, how many of you have a trust and refinance your house? Can you type in a chat box for me? You, you went and did a trust, you put your house in a trust and you refinance. Eduardo Perez, Eduardo Perez. So. Eduardo Perez had a trust. Eduardo Perez refinanced it. And let's just say Eduardo Perez, let's just say, you know, the lender took your house out of the trust. So that's under your name solely, Eduardo Perez. And you refinance it. You got a super low interest rate. You, you took a million dollars out of your house. Life is so good for you, Eduardo Perez. And you just forgot to put it back into the trust. 
you forgot to put it back in the trust. I go on a parade, you die. You have a trust, but the house is not in the trust. And Guada Perez, does a Guada Perez family need a probate? And Guada Perez had the trust. The house was in the trust. And Guada Perez refinanced the house. The lender took it out of the trust to, to get it refinanced, but it never went back into the trust. What happened? Do I need a probate? What do you guys think? Okay. So, so, so what you need, guy, what you need is, is called a um, Hextead petition. Okay. And a Hextead petition only works, it, it works in this manner, guys. If you have a pourable will, okay. So you had a trust. Mom, mom refinanced the house. Mom died. The house came out of the trust. You would look through this binder, guys. You would look through this binder. Look, look through the binder and find a something called a pour over will. A pour over will. Okay. A pour over will. P O U R W V E R will. A pour over will. With a pour over will, we can go to court and convince the judge that, hey, here's a pour over will. It's a legal document. That says everything I own goes to the trust. Okay, so a probate takes one year to do. If that ever happened to you, if that ever happened to you, where the house fell out of the trust, but you have a trust, your children, your family can do something called a hex that petition, which takes about four months to do versus a whole year in probate. Okay, yeah, so, so, so just remember that it's called a hex that petition, a hex that, okay. Hextet just comes from a very um, famous case in the late 80s, an exact situation, and the judge says no probate needed. Okay, yeah. So, so, so in this binder, guys, in so so in this binder should have your trust and a pour over will. Okay, yeah. All right. So, all right. Next, next. Um, your your binder guys should also have a um should also have a uh, power of attorney it, it's very important so let's say for example um an elderly couple wife and husband they come to you and say hey can you sell our house can you sell our house my husband has dementia my husband has alzheimer's this house is too big this house in glendora is too big sell this house the wife is fine. So the wife signs your listing agreement, contract with your listing agreement for you to sell the house. The husband has dementia. The husband has Alzheimer's. Can you continue on with your real estate transaction? Husband, has, husband is, yeah. So husband, dementia, Alzheimer's, right? Wife is fine. What you can ask for is a power of attorney. If the husband does not have a power of attorney appointing the wife to deal with real estate transaction, you have something called a conservatorship. Conservatorship. Okay. Conservatorship is no good. It's very expensive. Um, conservatorship is like this. Husband and wife. Husband has dementia. So the wife has to go to court and says, hey, judge. Hey, judge. My husband has dementia. Judge, let me be in charge of my husband. Let me be in charge of my husband. Let me sign his name. Let me sign his name to everything, including that real estate transaction. That's called conservatorship, okay? So you don't want that, guys. Make sure that your, make sure that this binder has a trust, a power of attorney, and a portable will. Something else too called an advanced healthcare directive, okay? and then a grand deed to show that the trust is the owner of all real estate. What I'm gonna do for you guys is this. I am now going to move away from a trust now, but in your spare time, you ought to do this. In your spare time, what I, what I wanna do is this. In your spare time, I want you to take out your trust. Watch this video. 
that I made on what makes a good living trust, what, what's a good component of a living trust. I'm going to paste this video uh, in the chat box. I'm going to paste it out um, onto the chat box. Oh, let me see here. Um, so don't do it now, but you can click on this link later. It gives you a good tutorial about, yeah, it's, it's, it's about a 20 minute video exercise to see that, hey, what makes, what makes a good trust? Does your trust binder have everything that's needed to protect you and your family, okay? So you can go to that video later. It's a, it's a 20 minute uh, video on what makes a good trust. So when you click on that, when you click on that link, it'll take you to my website and you'll see this and that's the video you're gonna watch, okay? That's the video you're gonna watch. It'll give you a good understanding of what makes a good trust, what, what makes a good estate planning, okay? All right, I'm now gonna move away from trust. I'm now, I'm now going to move away from, hey, someone passed away, the house is in the trust, what do you do? I'm done with that. Any question regarding trust before I move on? Okay, so, um, all right. So now, now that no one has a question on trust, on, you know, a living trust, I will move on to uh, probate, okay? Oh, um, so Elaine Flores asks, we have our trust, but needs to get it notarized. Hire any notary? Um, so Elaine Flores, so, so, I, and so I'm guessing Elaine Flores, you did your own trust, okay? So, so, um, so, so maybe this is a good question. Can you do your own trust? Can you do your own trust? So the answer is yes, you can do your own trust. Of course you can do your own trust. You can do your own estate planning, okay? And the analogy that I like to give is if you have a toothache, you can pull out your own teeth too. You don't need to go see a dentist. You don't. Just take a plier, pull out your own teeth, you're done, right? Good, yeah. It's like someone saying, I can sell my own house, right? Okay, yeah, you can, but you know, you're not gonna get a, a good of a price as if you hire a realtor, right? Okay, so. So yeah, so Elaine Flores, I would really be careful. That law office that prepared it for you didn't do a very good job, okay? They should have, from A to Z, they should have took care of the notary for you, okay? I would really think twice about that, uh, about that law firm, okay? All right, let's, um, let's um, continue, okay? So now let's talk about probate. Let's talk about probate. So you pull the grandee, you pull the grandee, the house is under the decedent's name, okay? The daughter comes to you, the son comes to you, my mom passed away, my dad passed away, or my brother passed away, or my uncle, my friend, they come to you. The first thing you do is, the first thing you do is, so, 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 the first thing you're usually gonna pull, you 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 pull the grand deed, right? And it shows that the house is in is not in a trust. So, so the house is not in a trust. The house is not in a trust. If the house is not in a trust, it's gonna have to go through probate. But wait, mom left the will. The will says my daughter gets everything. I, I only have one daughter. My daughter gets everything. My son gets everything. So the house is not in a trust, but mom has a will. What do you guys think? Does this house need to go to probate? There's a will. What do you guys think? There's a will. Do I still need probate? Re Rebecca Skinner says, doesn't matter. Oh, come on. If there's a will, isn't there a way? If there's a will, isn't there a way to avoid a probate? And Rebecca Skinner, you're correct. Nope and no, right? When you when you look at the genesis of the word probate, it comes from a Latin word meaning to prove the will. Okay, so so a will is no good. A will will absolutely guarantee you probate. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, so 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 a will is no good. What I want to do with you is this. Okay, 
So the house is under the decedent's name. The house is under the decedent's name. The amount that needs to be probate is this. The amount is 166,250. So in so in 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 California, can you all see my screen? Can you all see my whiteboard on on the screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So so you only need a probate, guys. You only need a probate. You only need a probate if the amount if the amount is more than 166,250, the value of the house. If the value of the house is more than 166,250, you're gonna need a probate. Okay, you're gonna need a um, a, um, a probate. If the amount, if the amount, if the if the value of the house is between fit or, or raw land, is between 55. 55, 250 to 166, comma 250. That you're gonna do something called a petition to determine succession to real property. Okay. To real property. That is a you still need you still need to go to court, but that that's sort of a shorter procedure to do. Okay. If the amount is less. The amount is less than 55, 425. Then we do something called an affidavit, an affidavit regarding real property of small value, of small value. Okay. So these are the these are the three type of things that can go on when someone dies without a trust. If the value of the house is more than 166,250, it's a full blown probate. It's a full blown probate, takes a year to do. If the amount is between 55,250 to 166,250, then you do something called a petition to determine succession to real property. If the, if the raw land is less, the raw land or that house is less than 55,425 then welcome to something called an affidavit regarding real property of small value, okay? Um, all right, so let me see if, um, let's see here. Um, let me see if I have some questions. Um, okay. So when someone died with a house in California, are there any house in Southern California that's worth less? Someone owes a house, someone died, they don't have a trust. And if the value is more, if the value is more than 166,250, then it's going to need probated. And I guess the point is are there any houses in Southern California that is that's worth less than 166,250, guys? Are there any houses in California that's worth less than 166,250? All right. So, so there are some far in between in, in Southern California and Glendora, right? Glendora, where Steve R is at. The chances are it's 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 not gonna happen. So, so so yeah, so if you go on the outer skirt, like Barstow. You know, um, California City, <laughs> maybe right, but 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 the moment someone dies without trust, your thinking is probate, okay? And then if you if the house out in a boomy, if the house out in a boomy, right, <laughs> where is where it's less than one sixty six, but more than 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 two fifty five thousand, then you still need to go to court and do a petition to to determine succession to real property, raw land, okay. Next, is there any house that's worth less than fifty-five thousand four twenty-five? Any house worth less than uh, fifty-five thousand four twenty-five? Any house worth less than fifty-five thousand four twenty-five, guys? I don't know. Probably not, right? Yeah, there is. At Guadalajara, sign me up. Let me buy a couple from you at Guadalajara. 
you know, buy a couple of houses from you for less than 55,000 for, um, 425. Okay, so, 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 all right, just, just keep this in mind, okay? Just keep these numbers in mind, okay? If you have no trust and the house is worth more than 166,250, you're welcome to probate. Bam, done, okay? All right, so, um, so let's see here. Um, the court, hey, hey, probate takes a year to do. This technique that I'm teaching you, these techniques that I'm teaching you, like, 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 for example, if the house is worth less than 166, 250, then you don't need a probate. You can do something called a petition to determine the succession of the real property. Hey, why don't we just tell the judge that this house is worth less than 166, 250, so we can avoid full blown probate? What do you guys think about that? Ah, you know, the house on a good day is worth 220. On a bad day, on a windy day, yeah, maybe maybe we just put down 150 to avoid a probate. What do you guys think about that? What do you guys think about that? How the heck would the judge know? How the hell would they know? Iris Lamb says no cheating. Iris, Iris Lamb, you're right. No cheating. No cheating. But Iris Lamb, I'm not cheating. You know, on a windy day, it might be worth, you know, 159. Okay. The point is, guys, the point is, you just can't simply go to court and say that this house in California City is worth less than 166 to avoid a probate. You have to get an appraisal from a probate referee. The judge is not going to trust Paul Horn. The judge is not going to trust Iris Lamb, even though trying to, even though Iris Lamb is straight, you know, as an arrow. No, the judge wants to hear from a probate referee who's going to value the house. It has to be from a probate referee. So when you say, hey, judge, you know, this house is a fixer upper, you know, it, it's only worth 160, fine. Hire a probate referee to put a value in that house, to put a value in that house. And if it is indeed less than 166,250, then okay, yeah, then, then you can avoid a probate and do something called a um, petition to determine succession to real property, okay? Yeah, all right, so, okay. All right, so, so let's, let's move on to your traditional probate, okay? When we talk about probate in, Cal in, in Southern California, guys, when we talk about probate, we're, we are playing in this area right here. We're playing in a full-blown probate. We're playing in an area where the house is worth more than 166, okay? All right. So let's go there. Let's 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 understand the probate process. How does it work? Okay. All right. Let's go there. Okay. So, um, so Helen Helen says probate referee can be a problem. Helen says they typically just do a drive by and don't view the interior. <gasps> Helen, but how can you value your house by just doing a drive-by and comps? Helen, how, how, how can they possibly do that, Helen? Helen says, I don't know, but they just do it. And Helen, you are right. Helen's correct. They don't go inside the house. You, you have to let them know, hey, this is a Glendora house. It's been burned down to the ground, you know, <laughs> or the inside has all been burned down. There's in every single room, there's a hole going down to hell, you know, <laughs> that's huge. That's a big hole in every single room. You have to, in, 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 in those situations, you have to invite the probate referee to come in to see the house so that he can value it. If indeed it's less than 166,250, so that you can avoid a probate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so Helen is absolutely correct. They don't go inside house. So just be, just be watchful of that. Okay. If you're in a, if you're in a probate case, 
you know, um, if your house is super beat up, just in general, you know, and 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 I'm not talking about only if the house is super beat up, you ought to take pictures with a cost of repair from a couple of contractors, give it to the probate attorney so that he can forward it to the probate referee who's going to value it. For example, 500,000. When comp shows 800 grand, Zillow shows 800,000, comp shows 800,000. But you've done your very, very best selling this probate house for 500 grand because it's really only worth 500 grand because the interior is so beat up. You need a probate referee to go inside the house to witness all of these damages, give him a cost of repair so he can reflect it in his valuation. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so. So Iris Lamb asked the question, is a probate referee appointed by the court? The answer is yes. Once that son or that daughter is appointed as the personal representative, the court automatically appoints who the probate referee is. Okay? All right. Okay. So, 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 so that is the sort of a, um, a glimpse of the threshold amount when a probate is needed. Okay. How many of you have brother and sister? How many of you have four, four, four or five siblings? Can you just type in a chat box for me? How many of you have four or five siblings? Okay, um, Rano Beatty, Rano. So let's say you have five siblings. Rano, you, you, you have five siblings. Rano, your, your mom passed away. Your mom has a house. And the house goes to the five of you, Rano. Rano, follow me. So your mom passed away. Rano, your, the house goes to the five of you, you and your sibling, okay? And the house is worth, let's say, for example, um, this house is worth, for example, 500,000. Mom gave you, gave you a house, Ron, and, and your brother and sister is worth, is worth um, 500,000. And this is like 20 years ago, okay? Mom died 20 years ago. The house is under five names. Ron, oh baby, you and your siblings are real tight. Yeah, you gotta get along very well, okay? You are the Brady family, okay? Um, Rano, Henry, your brother Henry, he died. And now you need to sell this house. Follow me, guys. I'm teaching you something that's a little bit high level, but that you might come across. Mom died. The house is in five names. You have five children. One son, his name is Henry, died. The house was 500000 we're trying to sell this house. Do I need a probate for that house? So follow me. Mom died, gave the house to five kids. The house is worth 500,000. One kid passed away, one kid passed away. That one kid's share is 100 grand, right? Because the house is worth 500,000. That one kid's share is worth, 500, it's worth only 100 grand. Do I need a probate? We're trying to sell this house. Do I need a probate? This is a test, right? This is a test. What did we just talk about? This is a test. Guard Clark says, how is title vested? Tenant in common, right? It's owned by five people, tenant in common, okay? So, so then this is where it becomes very useful. We can avoid a probate because that, that house, Hen Henry, Ron or sibling, he owns one fifth of that house. The house was 500,000, it was one fifth, one fifth is 100 grand. So we don't need to do a probate. We can do something called a petition to determine succession to real property, okay? We send out a probate referee to value one fifth of the house. It's only worth 100. We can avoid a probate by doing a different procedure, okay? You all follow? Okay. Um, 
Helen says, possibly could go to the brother's heir. Yes, but the brother's heir still need to do that procedure, petition to determine succession to real property. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, this is good stuff, okay? This is this is stuff that, um, uh, you know, you don't, you're not gonna learn this stuff reading the internet. You're not, okay? This is just based on experience, you know? This is all we do in my office. It's probate all day long, okay? All right. Okay, so now let's 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 focus on let's focus on a full a full probate, okay? All right, so let me go to a chart. Let me go to a chart. Let me go to a chart. Oh, let's see here. Let me show you the chart of a probate process. Let me show you the chart. Okay. Um, let me show you the chart. Oh, let's see here. All right, this is the chart, guys. This is the chart of a um, of the entire probate process. This is the chart of the whole entire probate process. Okay. Probate takes. You can comfortably say it's going to take a month. Probate takes one month to do, <laughs> one year to do, one year. It takes 12 months to do. It takes one year to do to complete a probate in court, one year, okay? All right. Um, so my question to you is this, probate takes one year to complete. When, when can you sell this house? The son or daughter comes to you and says, please sell mom's house. You pull up the grand deed, too bad, so sad, it's, they, they don't have a trust, and needs to go to probate. They want to sell the house. They want to sell the house. When can you, when can you sell this house? Do you have to wait until the probate is done for you to sell this house? What do you guys think? Probate takes a year to do. You're, you're, they want you to sell this house. Do you have to wait until probate is completed for you to, to sell this house for them? And the majority of you are saying, no, you don't need to wait. And you would be right, okay? You would be right, okay? Um, you would be right, okay? So if we look at this chart right here, if we look at this chart, it takes one year to do a probate, okay? At the end of one year is when the son or daughter would get the house or would get the money, okay? So nothing goes to the son or daughter until the probate is completed. So the question is, okay, God damn, I don't want to wait one year to sell this house for them. Can I sell it before? Can I sell it during the probate process? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, you can do it, okay? All right, so when can you list this house? When can you close escrow in a probate? Okay. All right, so let's, so, so if we look at this diagram, guys, if we look at this diagram, so the lawyer would file the probate petition. We would start the case, file the case, okay? Start the case, file the case. And let's say we ask for full authority. We'll, we'll get into full authority versus limited authority. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But let's, let's just do something. Let's do the easy one first. The lawyer files the probate paperwork with the court. The lawyer gets a court hearing date. The lawyer goes to court. And, and at the two-month mark, there will be paperwork to show that that son, that daughter is in charge, okay? At that point, at that point, the court's gonna issue letters and orders, letters and orders. I'm gonna show you on the screen what order looks like. So this is a very important document, guys, where the court appoints that one daughter, that one son to be in charge. And the if you look in the screen, this is exactly what that form looks like. It's called order for probate, okay? 
signed up by the judge, order for probate. Sign up that says that son, um, Garth, that son, Ronald, that daughter, Iris, is the personal representative of this probate estate. Okay, very, very important document. It's called order for probate. Okay, along with this order, there is a there's another form, it's called letters. It looks exactly like this, guys, on the screen. It looks exactly like this. Okay, so very important. Two months after I start this case, two months after the probate attorney starts this case, if everything goes smoothly, about two months later, there should be this form called order, order for probate, and letters, okay? When these two forms comes out, and let's say it's full authority, it's full authority, then what you do as a realtor is give me the probate purchase agreement, give me the accepted offer, put it on the probate purchase agreement, you give it to the probate lawyer, email it to the probate lawyer. We now, we, we send out something called the NOPA. NOPA stands for Notice of Proposed Action. We let all the children, we let all the other children know, all the other heirs, that we're going to sell this house. That we're going to sell this house. Okay? That's called a Notice of Proposed Action. 15 days after I mail it out to everybody, then you can close that score. That's it, guys. So, so, so normally, normally about 90 days, guys. Normally about 90 days. Look at this chart. Look at this simplified chart. Now I have another chart, a simplified chart. You can close escrow 90 days from the day that I start this case for you. 90 days later, you close escrow. Because we do it correctly, we ask for full authority. Very, very important. Okay. All right. So that's called. That's how you handle a probate with full authority. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's see here. Um, okay. So, 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 you know, so, so guard, guard is correct. There's a lot of probate lawyers who don't know about who doesn't know the difference between full authority and limited authority. Okay. When you have a house, when mom died with a house and all the children are trying to sell this house, you always should ask that probate lawyer to give you full authority, to petition the court, to ask the judge for full authority. Okay. If you have full authority, if you have full authority, then you can close escrow, say 90 days from the day that I start the case. If you don't have full authority, you're going to close escrow about six months, seven months, eight months after I start the case, if you're lucky. Full authority, three months to close the case. Limited authority, right? It's going to take you nine months, a year to, to sometimes to um, close escrow. Very, very different. So if you have a piece of real estate in a probate, you want full authority, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, stay away from limited authority. And so, and so what Garth Clark is saying that some lawyer don't know this, some probate attorney don't know this, and it's true. You know, so how, so how will you sort of, um, oh, so here, that, 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 that kind of leads me to this question, Fernando Gomez. Fernando Gomez says, under what circumstance would someone have limited authority? What Fernando Gomez really is asking is this, Paul Horn, what are you smoking, right? What are these probate attorneys smoking, giving people limited authority? Give Fernando Gomez some too. It must be a good smoke. That's why he's asking me, what are you smoking, you lawyers? God damn, I give us full authority all the time so we can sell this house easier at a high price for our client. What the hell are these probate lawyers smoking? Give you some too. Give Fernando Gomez some too. It must be good, right? That's a good question, Fernando Gomez, right? 
Why don't we get full authority all the time to sell this damn house? What's wrong with you lawyers? That's the question on the table. Right? That's the question on the table. Why the hell do we see limited authority? Garth Clark says limited authority means more money for the lawyer. That's true. That is so cynical. God damn it. I knew lawyer was shark. I knew they were bad. All right. All right. Look, look. There's good apples and bad apples in every industry, right? You and I both know that. Okay. Okay. So, so what I would tell you is the most of the time, where you have limited authority is due to inexperienced probate attorney, inexperience. So when you hire a probate attorney, how would you know? How would you know? Or when you're hiring someone to do your trust, how would you know if that lawyer know what he or she is doing? I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you how to always guarantee full authority. I'm gonna tell you how to guarantee your trust line correctly. This is what you're gonna do. You're going to go to Google, right? Google knows everything. Just ask Google. Just ask Google. Google knows everything, right? You're going to check that lawyer out. For example, Paul Horn. Just type in Paul Horn, right? Type in Paul Horn in Google. Let's say Paul Horn attorney, for example, right? You're going to, you're going to type in Google. Very easy. Paul Horn attorney. Type in Google. Google.com, Paul Horn attorney. Press enter. Google is going to say, hey, do you want to go to the state bar? The state bar is the licensing board that license all the attorneys, click on it, and the licensing board is going to tell you what, kind, what type of law does this lawyer specialize in. If this lawyer specialized in probate law, he, we will give that lawyer an extra credential. We will certify that lawyer. We, it's extra test, extra exam, extra process. We'll certify that lawyer as having specialty in probate law in the state planning. This is the way the State Bar of California helping the general public to separate the professional from the amateur by certifying, right? By certifying each lawyer what they specialize in. Okay, very important. If you just go to State Bar, if you see that that lawyer has a specialty in probate law and the state planning, then, then you know you're in good hands. So that's one way to ensure that you have full authority when you're choosing a probate attorney. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let's sort of back up a little bit. So, so, so just kind of to pull the curtain back on, on how a smooth transaction would go. So let's say it's your client mom died, the daughter calls you and says, hey, um, you know, Garth Clark, hey, um, you know, Jesse, hey, um, uh, Cheryl, you know, can you please sell a house? You pull the grand deed, the house is under mom's name, okay? There's no trust, it needs to go to probate. So what, what I would do at that point then is, I would have a Zoom meeting. The lawyer, me, I would have a Zoom meeting with all the heirs. And you, the listing agent, together, all of you together, okay? Let's say mom died with five children. Mom died with five children. Which of the five has the power to be in charge, guys? What do you guys think? Mom died, there's no trust. Mom has five children. Which of the five can become the personal representative? Which of the five? What do you guys think? Mom has five children. Which of the five has the power to be the personal representative? Eduardo Perez says, by birthright, right? The oldest one, okay? But he's the oldest one because he has more gray hair, right? Gray hair means more wisdom, right? That, that's what it must be, the oldest one. Okay. So, so look, okay? Any of the five, any of the five can petition the court to start the paperwork any of them okay but hopefully hopefully they come to an agreement to say hey you know let sister mary be in charge sister mary lives near the house sister mary's been taking care of mom and sister mary has you no know, two thousand dollars to pay for the court filing fees for example you know so 
So you, you want them to decide on one person. Why is that important? Why? So that there's no fight in court. So if, because if there's no fight in court in appointing the personal representative, there's no delay on your real estate transaction. Okay. So you want them to agree on one person. Okay. And then at the same time, in that meeting, in that Zoom meeting, where I'm meeting with the five plus you, the realtor, I'm going to ask, say, are we going to sell this house? They say yes. If they say yes, I'm going to say, hey, let's get full authority. Let's, let's get your realtor to list this house right away. And let's get this house sold to say 90 days from the day that we start. Okay. So, so, and then you're listing your, so technically the person out of the five children, out of, out of the five children, out, out of the five children, the one child who everybody agree upon or who takes the lead to file, to, to go see that lawyer, to file this prior petition, we, we call that person the petitioner, the petitioner, okay? I want to go over with you a quick vocabulary, okay? I want to go over you a, a quick vocabulary and I want you to memorize this, this vocabulary, okay? Mom has five children. That one son, that one daughter who starts the case, who is in charge, is called a petitioner. It's called a petitioner. He or she is petitioning the court to to appoint her or him as being the person in charge, okay? So it's, 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 it's called the person who starts the case, that one son, that one daughter, is known as the petitioner. Once that petitioner has been approved, then we call that person the personal representative, the personal representative, okay? So that son, that daughter starts this case. Once the judge approve him or her as the one in charge, then we call him or her the personal representative. And then if mom left a will, if mom left the will choosing an executor, then we further call that person, we, then we further call that personal representative. We further, so, so a shortcut for personal representative is PR. Personal representative is kind of a shortcut for personal representative. We call that PR. If there's a will, we call that PR the executor, the executor, okay? If there is no will, then we call that PR. What does PR stand for? Personal representative, we call that personal representative the administrator, the administrator, okay? Yeah, so remember this vocabulary because it's, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's very precise. It's, it is, it's precise as the listing agent, right? And the, um, and a selling agent in your world, okay? Yeah, so remember this vocabulary, please, okay? All right. Um, so, so going back here, going back here, okay? Um, going back to my chart, going back to my chart. Um, so where are we? We filed the probate case, Okay, the lawyer goes to court. No one needs to go to court, not the realtor, not any of the heirs, just the lawyer, okay? When a lawyer goes to court, he or she gets that petitioner, that son approved, then that person is known as the personal representative and the court will issue something called letters, remember? Do you remember letters? Remember how in the beginning I showed you this form? Letters and orders, letters and orders, okay? These two form is going to officially signify, signify that your son, that son, that daughter is the personal representative. Okay. And at that point, if you have an accepted offer, you give it to the probate attorney. You put it on the car listing agreement, the car zip form, the probate purchase agreement. It's a form known as the probate purchase agreement. You put it on, you put the accepted form on that accept an offer on that form, the probate, the probate purchase agreement, and you email it to the probate attorney, who in turn is going to do what? Who in turn is going to generate this third form? 
no, known as the notice of proposed action and mail it out to all the kids. 15 days later, you can close escrow. When you, when you are in a probate transaction and you have full authority, when you have full authority, the, the uh, escrow, the escrow, so if it's, if it's full authority, escrow, so it's full authority probate, escrow is gonna ask you for three things before you can close. One, order for probate. Two, certified letters. Three, NOPA. What does NOPA stands for? Help me out, people, help me out. What does NOPA stands for? Notice of proposed action. Notice of proposed action, okay? Very easy, you see, with, with, with full authority, you get these three forms in 90 days, you close that square. It's as simple as that, guys. It is that simple, as a full authority. That's how you handle a probate, it's that simple, okay? Yeah. Um, so, so, so Gart Clark says, hey, you know, can, can you close sooner than 15 days? They all have a note, all have the notice of the post action sign. So, so you, so, so I mail out the notice of the post action. You have to wait 15 days. We can get rid of that 15 days if they sign a waiver, waving it off, waving it off. Hey, you know what? We, we know our brother, John, or sister Mary selling this house. Let us sign a piece of paper. Ah, let's do away with the NOPA. We don't need to see it. We're going to waive it. Okay, let's call it waiver. Yeah. Okay. Now let's move on to limited authority. So let's say if you are unlucky and you got stuck in one of the un, um, a, um, unlimited case, a limited case. Remember, so, so, so when I do, when every single lawyer, when they file the paperwork, when they file the paperwork, um, when they start the probate case, they're always gonna have a choice between full authority and limited authority. So the initial paperwork, the initial probate petition, that uh, the initial paperwork that ignites the probate process is known as the probate petition. And in the probate petition, you have a chance to let the judge know, hey judge, please give us full authority or give us limited authority, right? So, so in that original probate petition that jump starts um the case you have a chance to ask the judge hey give me full authority or give us limited authority okay so let's say if you are stuck in a limited authority case okay what would you do how how would you sell that house um how how would you sell that house um so limited authority case um this is the process this is the process. So I'm gonna to go to my note, okay? This is how you would sell a house that has limited authority, or this is how you would buy a house in probate with limited authority, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go back to my notes. Um, and and, and just, just to give you a, a, a roadmap, we're gonna go through limited authority, Take questions. Then we're gonna talk about taxes, Proposition 19, toward the end a little bit, okay? So so there's plenty more I'm gonna teach you. So, but for, but for right now, let's focus on limited authority. So this is the process of how you would sell a house with limited authority, okay? So let's say, for example, orders, letters and orders are issued, okay? So, you know, it could be the same process Two, two months after I start the case, letters and order comes out. Okay, so if we look at my chart, if we look at my chart, my uh, probate process chart. Um, so when we start this case, we, we petition for probate, we file that form, petition for probate, okay? When it's full authority, limited authority has been requested. Five to six weeks after we file, there's a court date. I, so for example, the lawyer goes to court and let's say the judge appoints that son, that daughter with limited authority, okay? Because that's what it was asked for or something, or the judge might ask some question and that lawyer didn't know how to handle it. 
or something happened in between where, let's say the son and daughter are fighting and it ends up with limited authority, okay? And at that point, letters and orders are issued. So same process like, like, like with full authority, letters and orders are issued, okay? So if we go back to my, um, my note tip, all right, so limited authority probate, letters and orders are issued. Now with limited authority, it's a rule. It's a rule when you're trying to sell a house, when you, the listing agent, selling a probate house and it's limited authority, it's a rule that you're gonna have to, your accepted offer has, has to be within 90% of what the probate referee says is worth. So in every single probate case, in every single probate case, whether it is full authority or limited authority, a probate referee has to be used to value this house, okay? So it, it's just that with limited authority, whatever price you're selling at, it has to be at least 90% of what they value for at least. you. You can certainly sell for way more, not a problem. It just has to be at least 90%. You can go more, no problem. It's just that if it's limited door, you cannot go less. You cannot go less, okay? You can definitely go more, but never less, okay? That's the 90% rule. And because it's limited authority, the buyer has to put down 10%. The buyer has to put down 10%. So for example, if the house, if the house that you're buying is 800 grand, you gotta put down 10%. You gotta put down 80,000 because it's limited authority, okay? That's, you know, that that's huge, right guys? That's huge. You gotta put down 10%, okay? You gotta put down 10%. The buyer's gotta put down 10% if it's limited authority, okay? Um, let me hear from you guys because you guys are the realtors out there. Um, what is the normal down payment these days? What is what, what? Let's say if you average it all out, what's the what's the normal? If you average everything out, what's the normal down payment? So Iris Lamb says three percent. Norma says three percent. Eduardo Pro says five percent. Uh, Linda Duffy says three yeah. percent. So so as you can see. You know, as, as, as you can see, right, 3%, 5%, but with limited authority, it's 10%. Now, if it's full authority, you can do 3%, no problem. If it's full authority, you can do 3%, no problem. If it's limited, you must go 10%. Earnest money deposit. It's a must. Okay? Yeah, so just keep that in mind if it's limited authority. So, so if it's limited authority, what... What is it doing now? It's raising the bar now, right? It's raising the bar now. It's cutting, it's cutting a lot of potential buyer now, you know, uh, conventional, FHA, whatever loan. It, it, now you are limiting the pool now of buyer, okay? Because of, ten, because of that 10% deposit rule, okay? Now next, what else? So now the buyer, he puts down 10%. He has to clear all contingency. He's he's got to say, okay, all the contingency are cleared. You know, meaning they have um, checked the house, hired an appraiser, everything is good. They 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 check the house, repairs, everything, everything is good. They're removing all contingency. We're ready to close. At that point, the probate attorney has to set a court date has to set a court confirmation date. Have any of you dealt with the court before, guys? Have Have any of you ever had court experience? Like for example, someone sued you or you were involved with your parent, your uncle's lawsuit. When you involve the court, it, it is never fast. It's always so slow, okay? You put 10% down, you clear all conditions. See, now the lawyer has to go to court and set a court date for everybody to go to court to confirm that sale. So my point is, every time you have to involve the court, get a court date, it takes a long time. So another obstacle, it, when you go and request a court date, it might be you know 60 days or, or 70 days afterward. 
Imagine that. It took you two months to get that person approved. It takes you another two to three months to publish a newspaper, get a buy. Now you have four months. And now you, you get a buyer. The buyer does all his due diligence, remove contingency. Now we have five months. Now the lawyer goes to court and says, okay, you know, give us a court date to confirm the sale. And the, and, and the court looks at their calendar and go, okay, the next developer is three months. Now you have eight months. Okay. So eight months goes by and we go to court, for example, we go to court. At that court hearing date, guy, at that court hearing date, other people can show up to bid on the house. So let's say, for example, let's let's say that the original offer is five hundred thousand. That original buyer, the probate estate, the personal representative accepted the offer for five hundred grand. Now we go to court. Eight months later, someone else can show up to bid on that house. Let me ask you, guy. You have an accepted offer. You you. You, you have an accepted offer. You're going to go to court to let the judge give his blessing, but other people can show up on that day to bid, to bid on our house and steal the house away. How do you feel about that? If you're the listing agent, if you're the buyer, you're so excited that you're going to get this house, but someone else can show up and pay more and take this house away from you. From a business standpoint, how do you think, from a market standpoint, how do you think people will feel about that process? Do you think you will deter some buyer away from this house because they have to go through that process? Put down 10%, clear the, clear the contingency, go to court just to have someone shows up to bid a little more and take the house away from you? Eduardo, you're right, it's, it's, it's horrible. Right. So, so when you, when, when, when it's, when it's not, it, it, it shrinks the, the number of buyer even further. Okay. People don't like that. Okay. People don't like that. So that's another thing with limited authority. Full authority, you close in three months, limited authority, you close in eight months, maybe plus all these conditions that you got to meet. 10% deposit, publish in a newspaper, go to court. Someone else can go to court and bid more on the house and take the house away from you, okay? All right, let's say, let's say, let's say, um, let's say you go into court. Let's say you brought an investor to court. You bring an investor with you to try and steal that house away. Okay. So the accepted offer is 500 grand. There's a court date where, uh, where people can show up to bid on that house. You, and, and you know, you, you guy out there can make a pretty good living right now. The market is so tight. You can bring your investor with you guys to bid on these houses. Your invest, so you tell your investor, hey, this house right here, it's 500,000. This house is 500,000. I'll take you to court that day so you can bid on this house. Your investor's gonna say, okay, um, how does it work? Is, is the judge gonna go 500,000 plus a dollar? Is the judge gonna go 500,000 plus a thousand? You know, where, where, how does the bidding work, okay? Where is the bidding going to start at? Where the bidding number is going to start at has a, uh, a, a very precise formula, okay? And I'll show you that precise formula. So, so the accepted offer is 500 grand. The judge is going to, if there are other people in court that day to bid on that house, the starting bid number the starting bid number is 525,500, 525,500, where the, the original offer is only 500, but the judge is gonna start the bidding at 525,500. So how did he get there? How, how did the judge come up to start the bidding with 525,500? Well, there's a very precise formula, okay? It's, 
It's called the overbearing formula, okay? So just, just copy exactly what you see on the screen. Take a snapshot of exactly what's on the screen, okay? So, so the accepted offer is 500,000, for example. You're going to take 10% of the first 10,000, which is a grand. You're going to take 5% of the remaining. So 5%, it will be 5% of 490, right? 5% of 490 now. How, how did I get 490? By taking 500,000 minus 10 grand is 490. 5% of 490 is 24,500. I add up 24,500 plus a grand plus the 500,000 gives me 525. So this is the starting bid number. The judge will start at 525,500, okay? Memorize this formula. Take a snapshot of this formula, okay? That's how the overbidding works in court, okay? Um, memorize this formula. So for example, let's say for example, if the over a different house, a different case, the accepted offer is 600,000. Your investor is a limited authority. Your investor wants to go to court that day to see if they can steal that house, steal that deal. Your investor asks you, what's the starting bid number? What's the calculation? Okay, what's the calculation? Here we go. Follow exactly the same setup, the same formula like this. Another example, right? The accepted offer is 600,000. 10% of the first 10,000 is a grand. 5% of the remaining. So it's going to be 5% of 590. How did I get 590? I won 600,000 minus 10 is 590. So 5% of um, 590 is 29.5. So you add up 29.5 plus a grand plus 600. The starting bid number guy is 63500. 63500. If that is your client, your your potential investor that's going to go bid, he needs to bring a cashier check. Bring a cashier check for 63050. 63050. Okay. 63050. Okay. All right, guys. Um, okay. Yeah, so at, at Guado Perez says, you know, it's not fair for the original buyer. That may be true, you know. So that's why I, I'm telling you, when you have a probate case, always get full authority. It makes a big, big difference. Okay. All right, guys, that is limited authority. Let's talk about your commission. Let's talk about your commission in a probate case. How much money do you get as a commission as a realtor in a probate case? What do you guys think? How much can you charge commission-wise for probate cases? You're the listing agent. What will be your commission? Let's say we are in LA County. We are in... Um, let's do full authority first. Full authority. If it's full authority anywhere, any county, 6%. Full authority anywhere in California, 6%. If it's limited authority, guys, if it's, if, if it's limited authority, 5%. If it's, if it's limited authority, it's 5%. Okay. So Helen made a comment. Helen says, subject to court approval. Subject to court approval. So Helen, if a case is full authority, the selling of the house never goes to court. So it does not, when it's full authority, it doesn't need court confirmation, okay? 6% will always work. 6% for full authority will always work. If it's limited authority, go with 5%. Limited authority, 5%. Okay, that is your commission. That is your commission. Okay. Um, Rich asked me, how about non-agent? I don't know what you mean. If you're a non-agent, can you make a commission? Rich, what do you mean by that? What about non-agent? If you're a non-agent, are you practicing real estate? Are you charging commission? Okay. So... If you're a realtor, commission, 6%, okay? Um, but Rich, if you are an investor, how the heck are you gonna charge a commission, Rich? Talk to me, how do you do that? Let, so, so, 
So, so, so Rich, normally if you're an investor, you just buy the property, you know, you just buy the property, right? If you're an investor. Okay. Iris Lamb says, can seller negotiate the commission? Yes. So who negotiated the commission, Iris? Is it a probate attorney? Is it his secretary? Is it the judge? Who? Um, the precise person to negotiate the commission, Iris Lamb, is the personal representative. Who chooses the realtor, guys, in a probate case? Who chooses the realtor in a probate case? It's a probate case. They need to sell the house. Who, precisely, who chooses the realtor? Norma uh, Eduardo says PR. PR is correct. Personal representative, right? PR stands for personal representative. The personal representative has the liability to make sure that everything's done correctly. So the personal representative is the person that ultimately chooses the realtor, okay? All right. So I talked about how much um, you get paid. Let's talk about the attorney. How much does the attorney get paid, guys? How much? How much does the probate attorney gets paid in a in a probate case? Um, Adi ba uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Adi Bio says a gazillion dollar lawyer makes too much money. They are sharp, you know, they just suck blood. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we get paid, guy, is statutory. I, I'm going to show you, okay? What we get paid is called the statutory fee. So let me just show you what it looks like, okay? Um, so it's set by the state of California. It's 4% of the first 100,000 and then 3% and then 2%. So for example, oh, let me see here. Actually, I have a better chart for you. I have a, I have a better chart for you. Let, um, let me see here. Let me see here. I'm gonna, so what the lawyer gets paid is set by the state of California, okay? And I'm gonna show you the percentage. It's set, it's set by the state of California and I'll show you a percentage. Oh, let's see here. Um, let's see here. I'm going to show you a percentage. Okay, here we go. So here's the law set by the state of California. It goes like this. You look on the screen. Is 4% of the first 100,000, 3% of the next 100 grand, and then 2%. So for example, if the house is worth a million bucks, the house is worth a million dollars, the way you calculate the fees, the state of California calculate the fee is 4% of the first 100 grand would be 4,000. 3% of, of the next 100 grand is three grand. And in 2% of the next 800 grand. So 2% of 800 grand is 16,000. So for a house that's worth a million dollars, the probate attorney would get 23 grand. The personal representative, which, whichever child is in charge, also get the same amount, 23 grand. Okay. So if you look here, this is the law right here is probate code. California Probate Code 8, uh, Section 10, 810, it sets out the statutory commission, 4%, 3%, 2%, and 1%, just as you see on the screen, okay? All right. One thing I want to cover to you, this cost doesn't cover the court filing fees. When, ha, have you guys ever been to the DMV? You have to pay a fee, right? The, the DMV fee, same thing with court. Whenever you do something in court, they charge a filing fee, a filing fee. 
So no different in the probate world, no different in the probate world, okay? When you first start the case, the court's gonna charge 465 bucks. The court, not me. The court's gonna charge 465. Um, the, um, they make you publish in a newspaper, that may cost 250, it may cost 500. The probate referee charges one tenth of 1%. So if the house is worth 500 grand, the probate referee is gonna charge about five, 500 bucks, okay? There's gonna be a bond cost. Whoever is in charge, it's just in case he or she runs away with the money, that son, that daughter, who is the personal representative, they, the court's gonna place a bond on that person. So if Mary's in charge, um, Mary is gonna sell the house, the money sits in the state account, Mary cannot touch it, but Mary decides to go to Vegas, she needs some money, she takes the whole amount and go to Vegas, put it on red, she loses all the money, the bond company, it's insurance, will pay her brother and sister. That's called bond. To close the case, the court charged another 465. So all in all, court fine fees, you can look, it's probably gonna be around 2,500 for the court. 2,500 for the court. What, what is that 2,500 bucks for? Court filing fee, newspaper, bond, and insurance, okay? And probate referee. Okay, so those are sort of the costs involved. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, okay, all right, I'm looking for questions. Um, yeah, news, newspaper could be pretty expensive for the newspaper. Newspaper can run 500, can run 1,000, okay? Yeah, so that's, you know, so, 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 Probate is simply very expensive. It's true. It's simply very expensive. So that's why, you know, um, that's why a trust makes a lot of sense. Get a trust. Um, so, so if you own a house, guys, you should you should get a trust. When should you get your trust done? Do you do you guys know when when you get your trust done? If you own a house. When's a good time? So, so a good time to get a trust is this. Um, you look at your calendar and you find out when you're gonna die and you call me. You say, hey, Paul, I'm gonna die on such, such a day. Let me come in two weeks before that. Well, that's, that's, that's crazy, right? So if you have a house, you ought to get a trust, put your house in the trust to avoid a probate, okay? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so Linda Duffy says, in doing a Hexted petition, put it back in the trust, no probate. Okay, so Linda Duffy, if it's a quality trust or a quality portable will, and the house happens to be for some reason not in the trust, you do a hex step petition, and when you do a hex step petition, it's it's not a probate. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, let's see. Um, taxes. Would you guys like to learn about taxes? Taxes. Okay. Who 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 in the webinar have bought their house say thirty years ago and still have it? Just type in the chat box. Who, who's here on the, on, on the webinar bought a house 30 years ago and still have it? Linda Duffy. How much how much did you buy your house for, Linda? Linda Duffy, how much did you buy your house for? Just just make up a number or, or oh 400 grand. Great, Linda. Thank you. You bought it 400 grand. How much is it worth now, Linda? You bought it for 400,000. How much is it worth now? You bought it for 400. It's worth 2.9 million. It's a good example. All right. So, so, so Linda bought it for 400,000. Now it's worth 2.9. Linda is going to live another 20 years. Okay. Linda Duffy, I don't know how old you are. This is for example, let's say you die at 100 years old. I'm doing an example. Let's say when you pass away, Linda, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, the house was 5 million. Okay. 
So Linda Duffy, you bought it for 400 grand. When you die, it's worth 5 million. It's gonna go to your son, your daughter. It's gonna go to your son, your daughter. Your son or daughter is gonna sell the house for 5 million because it's worth 5 million. Linda only bought it for 400 grand. So technically, there's a huge profit, right? Linda only bought it for 400 grand. She sold it for 5 million. So technically the profit is 4.5 million, okay? The beautiful thing about the tax law is it gives, it gives Linda's children a step up in basis. So on a date on a date of Linda's death, step up basis shows 5 million. If Linda sells it for five, if her children sells it for 5 million, zero capital gain, zero. So Linda, the good news is don't give this house to your kid until you die. Okay, so 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 Linda, what will you do is you put your house in a trust. When you die, it goes to your kid, and your kid sells it for five million. They pay zero capital gain. Linda, Linda Duffy, don't make the mistake. Don't make the mistake of saying, "Oh man, but I only have one daughter. My name is Linda Duffy. I only have one daughter." I, I don't want to get a trust. You know, I don't want to pay that obnoxious Paul Horn to do a trust. He's obnoxious. Have you heard him talk? He's crazy. So Linda Duffy says, I only have one daughter. I'm just going to give the house to my daughter now. You know, I'm 80 years old. I'm 90 years old. I only have one daughter. I'm, I'm just going to transfer the house to my daughter now. And I don't, and I don't even need a trust. No, 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 no. Paul Horn, I just saved 2,500 bucks. What do you guys think of that? Save money from doing a trust. Screw the lawyer, right? Don't go to them. Don't need a trust. You only have one son, one daughter. Just give the house to your son, daughter now. So Linda Duffy gives the house to her daughter right now. And no trust needed. So when she dies, because the house is under her name, no probate needed. What do you guys think? Right? No, did not, did not have to spend money to do a trust. Screw the lawyer. Yay, win-win, right? The problem is this. She does not get the step-up basis. When, the da when Linda's daughter sells it for $5 million, for example, and, Lin and, and Linda's cost basis is only four hundred grand, the daughter would pay tax on $4.5 million. There's no step-up basis if you give the house to your children while you are alive. And Jesse is absolutely correct. That is penny wise and pound foolish. So don't ever give a house to your child while you're alive because you destroy the step up basis. Huge point. Do you all get that? Any question on that? Okay. All right. So that's the IRS taxes. Rich says, can you remove a child? Rich says, I have sinned. I have made a mistake. Can I remove it now? Can I remove her? Maybe, right? Maybe. Try it, you know? Okay, so, so. Um, going back to, going back to Linda Duffy. Going, going back to Linda, to Linda Duffy. Um, oh, Teresa says, Teresa says, all right, let's, 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 Teresa says, you know, the house was bought for 400,000 and when mom dies, it's worth 5 million. Teresa says, what if the daughter is not going to sell this house? Linda Duffy. Say yes. Are you still there? How? What is your property tax basis, Linda? Your property tax, the assessed value, Linda, is how much? Is it like 550? 900, okay. Linda is paying $900,000 property tax, but her house is worth 2.9. Right? She, she lives in a $2.9 million house, but her property tax is only 900 grand. Good deal for Linda, right? Because she's locked into Proposition 13. We're going to get to 19, Cheryl. But the reason why 
The reason why Linda Duffy gets to gets to live in a two point nine million dollar house and pay nine hundred thousand dollars property tax is because of Proposition Thirteen. The question is this, Linda. When you die, it's worth five million. Linda, when you die, it's worth five million. For example, your daughter, Linda, your daughter moves in and lives in that house. Your daughter moves in and lives in that house. What is her property tax going to be, Linda? She's not selling. Just like Teresa is saying, your daughter's not selling. She's living in that five million dollar house. Is her property tax still going to be 900 grand? What do you guys think? Linda, this is a good example for you. Your daughter is going to keep this house. Linda Duffy says $900,000 only if it's primary resident. Linda, Linda Duffy, I have good news and bad news for you. This, this is now Proposition 19 now. This is Proposition 19 now. Okay? This is Proposition 19. We're we're getting into now okay i'm going to show you the formula how to calculate linda duffy example linda duffy example she when she died the house was five million her her uh, property tax right now is based on nine hundred thousand. when she died her daughter's going to live there is the property tax going to get reassessed we're going to answer that question right now okay all right, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a um, a little um, chart that I made. Okay, I'm going to show you a Proposition 19 chart. Okay, um, and let's go there. Let's go there. All right, so I'm going to show you my PowerPoint. I'm going to show you my PowerPoint. Okay, so, so, Proposition 19, when you die, your son, your daughter gets your house, they're going to live in that house. Can they retain your low property tax basis? The answer used to be yes. The answer used to be if it's your primary resident, yes. The answer used to be that if it's your rental property is limited to a million dollars. Proposition 19 did away with rental property. If it's rental property, too bad, so sad, good night. Say goodbye to all your rental property. When you die, all your rental property is going to get reassessed. That's Proposition 19. Okay? So, so, point number one. Memorize these points I'm going to teach you, and you understand Prop 19. About 90% of it, you're going to understand it. Because Prop 19 is pretty complicated. Okay? Easy point. Rental property is going to get reassessed. Period. Say goodbye, say good night to rental property. It's going to get reassessed. Okay? All right. Primary resident. Primary resident. If it's mom and dad's primary resident. And, and it's got to be the child's primary resident, meaning the child has to move in there as well. Okay? So. Three prong tests. It's gotta be mom, mom and dad's primary resident. It's gotta be that child primary resident. The third prong test, number three test, there's a limit to it. It's the assessed value plus a million. Assessed value plus a million. So in Linda's example, let's go to Linda's example. Okay? Let's go to Linda's example. Um, let's go to Let's take a look at Linda's example. Linda's example, let's just say, oh, her, her assessed value right now, this is a live example, Linda's Duffy example. Her assessed value right now, her assessed value right now is 90K. When she died, it's 5 million. Okay, her daughter is going to move in. Okay, her daughter is going to move in. Her, her, her daughter is going to move in. So that makes it her daughter's primary resident. Okay, so that, that's good. 
that's good. You know, she remember how I said prop 19, you need to satisfy three prong. It's mom primarism and it's the child's primarism. We have that here. Okay. It was it's it's Linda Duffy's primary residence, and now it's the daughter's primary residence. We're good. Okay, so we satisfy those two prongs. The third prong we need to we need to satisfy is the, is the assess value. Assess value. Assess value plus a one million dollar cap. Okay, Linda Duffy's assess value is nine hundred grand plus a million. Add a million to it. Add a million to it. What do you get? You get one point nine million. One point nine million. One point nine. 1.9. The house was 5 million. So we take 5 million minus 1.9. What's that? 3.1. Right? That's 3.1. Okay. So the difference of 3.1. So we take 3.1, add it to um, 900,000. The new assessed value is 4 million. That's the new assessed value. It will not get reassessed to five, it gets reassessed to four, okay? Prop 19, guys, is pretty complicated. Prop 19 is pretty complicated. I want you to do this. If you have questions about Prop 19, I'm gonna refer you to a terrific site. You're gonna go to Google, right? Google knows everything, Google, and then you're gonna go Oh, let's see here. Prop 19, frequently asked question. Um, you're going to go to this one page. It's very good. This one page that the state of California has, frequently asked questions on, on, on Prop 19. This page right here. I'm going to cut and paste this link into the chat box. Later, if you have questions about Prop 19, go to this link. Go to this link. This link, this link has a lot of frequently asked questions. Okay, frequently asked questions. None of the question makes sense to you or your question wasn't on there. Call this number. Call this number, 916-274-3350. They will answer you. Okay, great, great phone number, great, great website to go to, to answer a question about Prop 19. Okay. Um, the other, the other part of Prop 19 that I do want to share with you today is this, if you, um, going back to Linda's Duffy example, Linda's Duffy example, Linda, let's say Linda's Duffy's house right now is worth, you know, 2.9 million, but she's paying property tax only on 900,000. Linda Duffy, if she's 55 years or older or disabled or lost her home uh, in a natural disaster, Linda Duffy can move, buy another house for 2.9 million or more. Let's say she buys a house for 2.9 million, her property tax will not get reassessed because of Prop 19. That's the good part of Prop 19. You can do it up three times, Linda. Linda, you can move three times, move next to all your children, take you know, see your lovely grandchildren, your property tax will not get reassessed. You can buy a $2.5 million house up to three times in your lifetime near your kids and keep your property tax at $900,000 when you're buying a $2.9 million house, okay? Very good to know for your business realtors, Proposition 19, okay? The good part of Prop 19, where it keeps the property tax the same, even though that individual is buying a new house, okay? Very, very important, very important. All right, guys, we're coming close down to the end, okay? You know, I um, I wanna thank Nancy for inviting me to be on here. I want, I want you all to give, if you found value in this uh, webinar, thank Nancy for reaching out to me, thanks Sivar. They're the one that put all this together, okay? Um, so, um, yeah, um, you know, thank you so much, all of you, for being with me today. You know, uh, Iris Lamb, thank you for joining us. Lisbeth, thank you for joining us. Everybody out there, Rich. And um, 
Eduardo Perez, thank you so much. And, um, you know, if you don't have any questions, I think my voice has uh, given me the signal that uh, I'm out of voice and out of time. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, all of you guys have been terrific. Great question. I look forward to doing this again. Nancy? Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. We always appreciate your time and your classes are so easy to follow and, and great information. So thank you so much. Um, a couple people had asked for um, the links. And so I copied the links from the chat and I put them in an email. So if anybody wants that information, um, I have the links for Paul's video um, that he uh, referred to at the beginning of the session and also the links for the um, the Prop 19. So if you would like those, just email me. Um, my email is noakley at cbar.net and I'll send those out to you. And if you wanna watch the recording of this session, you can find that at cvar.live or you can find the recording on our Facebook page. It's Citrus Valley Realtors on Facebook. And if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me and oakley at cvar.net. Uh, with that, thank you so much everyone for attending and always thank you, Paul. Yeah, one, 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 one last thing. I'm gonna paste in there a last video. It's about a 22 minute video on probate. I so, got it. I'm gonna so, put that in the in the links. Yeah, actually, let me do one more thing. Um, I think some people have asked me for a slide, so let me do one one more thing. If you, if you can bear with me for one second, I'm gonna give you this link. Oh, let me see here. Um, I'm gonna give you this link, Nancy, where you can email to them, where it's gonna give them the slide as well. Let me see if I can find that link. Give me one second, guy. If um, it's a really good link, you go there. It gives you the slide. It gives you a bunch of other goodies. Um, for example, the chart, the probate charts can give you that too. Oh, awesome. let me just see. Let me just cut and paste in to our chat box so that Nancy can email it out to all of you. Let's see here. Um, let's 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 see here. Um, yeah, here yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this link. I'm gonna put this link in. And Nancy is going to email it to you. You just, if you want the slide and all the good stuff, just go to this last link. You just go to that link and you'll get a whole bunch of freebies, uh, the chart and a bunch of good stuff. Yeah, just send me an email and I will um, send all this to you. Um, I have the link, I have the videos, I have the Prop 19 information, charts and slides, we are good to go. Just send me an email. It's noakley at cvar.net, c-v-a-r.net. Uh, with that, thank you so much again, Paul, for your time and your information today. It's always a pleasure having you here and teaching for us, and we really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, everyone who attended. I hope Thanks, everyone guys. has a great day and a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye.